I've got now the great, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Zarina Hashmi. Born in Aligarh in India, Zarina lives and works in New York City. After receiving a degree in mathematics, she studied printmaking. And we actually met when um, Julia Peyton Johns and Kuna Kwaran and I made the research for our Indian exhibition, The Indian Highway. We asked again artists um, in India again and again who were their heroes, and Sarina was mentioned many, many times. So we met in New York and recorded a long interview with Sarina earlier this year. And during this interview, Sarina told us a lot about this idea of the labyrinth as a garden and also the invisible garden, which will be the topic of her speech today. Sarina's work is in the permanent collection of many museums, the Victoria and Albert Museum here next door, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the Hammer Museum, the National Gallery of New Delhi, the Whitney Museum. A very, very warm welcome for Sarina Hashmi. Thank you. Very nice to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for in inviting me here. And in the meantime, I have uh, changed the title of my, uh, of my presentation because I thought about it. And I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the f uh, fragrant uh, garden of my, I have already forgotten. No, I haven't. The fragrance of my mother's garden at Aligarh. The reason was that uh, growing up in India, I, um, you know, there are tons of books which have been written about Islamic gardens in India, gardens in India, but no one ever talks about what women uh, grew, uh, especially women who came from Muslim families and uh, uh, spent their life within the houses of four walls. What did they do with their gardens? And there's hardly any material in, on that subject. So that's, that's, fair the, that's what I want to talk about. So, but you know, starting with, so this is the title of my, my presentation, um, starting with the map of Delhi, because I grew near Delhi and it always, uh, for me, Delhi unfolds like a big garden in my imagination. So this is, the, am I doing it or somebody's helping me? So that is where I got used to the first time I looked at uh, uh, Mughal gardens and got my eye was trained uh, in the architecture and the f uh, refinement and geometry. And the geometry has stayed with me all the time, and, and I love mathematics and architecture. Uh, I grew up in a very tra traditional Muslim household where male and female quarters were segregated. The women lived very traditional life, and my father being an acad academic, he was uh, lived a life which was influenced by his colonial education. So these were two worlds, and I was privileged to negotiate between different language and different aesthetics. And that has served me very well uh, in negotiating my life for 50 years outside of India. So I'm fairly comfortable with, uh, with different cultures. There, house, their parts, their quarters where my parents lived, they were furnished differently. The, uh, their, uh, when it came to gardens, they were, this is the outside of the house, and the house doesn't ex exist anymore, but that's where I was born, and this is the house I grew up in. Uh, my, when it came to selecting flowers, uh, we can even do the second one. This is the one view. So my, this is my father. 
you know, the male part of the house was, or the garden was very large with lawn and fruits and, uh, and all sorts of uh, uh, plants which my father plant, you know, ordered. And my father ordered uh, uh, seeds from foreign catalogs and tried to grow them in the arid, dry climate of northern India. My mother stayed with traditional garden, and her choice was always plants which were fragrant. And gardening was taken uh, very seriously. Uh, even the water which was used for irrigation was had to be pured, and sometime. Uh, sandalwood and other incense were included in uh, in that, and some people went as far as soaking the seeds in honey and uh, milk before planting. There were medicinal trees, but I wouldn't go because of the time constraints. What all my um, what my father grew, but uh, he was very persistent. And something, when he succeeded, we all will be invited to his, his part of the garden to, to look at it. I'm not, uh, as I said, I'm not an expert on public gardens, but I do know a few things about women's garden in India and also the relationship uh, with flowers in Southeast Asia because I have spent some time in Far East also. This is, uh, my mother's garden was enclosed within the boundary walls of the house. She had no access to great public art gardens. She chose the flowers for their fragrance and she was quite knowledgeable about uh, about the flowers and she knew her taste. Flower beds ran along the inside edge of the courtyard wall. The walls protected the flowers from the blazing summer sun and also provided space to support creepers and bushes to grow. Sometimes the gardeners will be called in to prepare the flower beds for planting or renewing the garden. Like any child, I looked at things with great concentration, and I still remember how the gardener would put stakes into the soil and then tie them with a cotton thread to define the line. Years later, I was using the same strategy to draw lines. I would put, put push pins. Can I have a little water, please? Thank you. And drawing board, and then tie them with cotton threads using the thread to guide the hand. The stake and the thread would be left in the would be left in the in the in the soil and slowly, eventually become part of the earth. Uh, there's a whole list of uh, flowers which my mother planted. Uh, they were basically, uh, came from the jasmine family, like uh, Indian names are Mogra, Bela, Mutia, Chambeli, for their fragrances. And also Champa, which, uh, you know, I have botanical gardens also, but it names, but it will take forever. Uh, it, but we were told that there are certain flowers which attract uh, snakes. So one has to be careful. Uh, her favorite and my favorite too until this day was uh, Queen of Night, uh, which blooms at night in the beginning and end of summer. It has tiny white flowers, which perfume the night air with its scent, which lingers to one's inner senses until the morning breaks the spell. We had marigolds for its colors. 
they are a bright orange color, but they don't have any fragrance. Then also there were fruit trees, guava, uh, custard apple, but my favorite was black mulberry, which one could climb and wash the caterpillars emerge out of their cocoons. We were not making sin, so. Growing up around this garden, we were also taught the etiquette of respecting the garden. And there was a whole list we were, we were not supposed to do. You don't touch the flowers, you don't go near the garden at night, you don't step on the flower beds. In the evening, we waited. I don't know if you have ever heard the blossoms when they open, There's a, but it's a very sort of, uh, it, you have to be, be in a country in a quiet place. But when we had to retreat after that, the night is the time for spirits and ghosts to enjoy the scents of the garden. Young girls were advised to stay away from garden at night because the ghosts might take possession of them and not return to their dark abodes. But you know, if you can't go anywhere, I think they were going crazy anyway. So it was blamed, uh, you know, they were taught it was because of the intervention of ghosts. We, we never cut flowers from the garden for the house. Married women would put flowers in their hair, twisting strings of bela and motia around their braids. I think the kind of relationship uh, in Southeast Asia and Far East uh, is much more important than the relationship with the garden because uh, flowers are, uh, you know, part of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's part of life for, for in religion, religious practices, marriage. And, uh, and you know, from, from uh, uh, beginning of life to, to end of life. I, so I grew up surrounded by trees and plants, watching their cycle of growth and decay. The garden was part of our life, but like my parents' garden, in their houses, there were two different sensibilities. Um, when it came to planting roses, it always needed much more space because you needed to uh, enjoy each rose without the interference of, of other roses. This I have. My mo mother's wall was enclosed within the four boundary walls of the house. And as she had no access to their, f to outside, I think she was trying to get, to make a little paradise. And these gardens were often, often called the the patterns, often described as patterns of color with the sparkle of scents. Flower beds ran along the inside edge of the courtyard walls. The, this I think we have. Uh, there was always an emphasis on geometry. Flower, flower beds were planted in precise rows and with different colors. The local uh, harvest festivals were, uh, what were we doing? Are we going back on this? No, uh, the, the, the father's, the map of father's house. So when it came to, this is the way that I, you know, I made a map of the house and that's where, uh, this was the women's quarter, the down here. 
and on the other side was the male, uh, male house, and this dividing line was in the center. And the beds, all the, all the flower beds grew here. And I decided to write all the names in, uh, in, in Urdu, my mother tongue. Throughout my travels, it was my mother's garden and her fragrant presence which remained most vivid in my psyche. She didn't like to be inside the, inside the rooms. She enjoyed being under the sky where she could imagine other places and other worlds. I often wanted to share with her my experience of watching boats full of flowers floating on the river Chao Priya in front of Wat Arun in Bangkok, or in Bangkok, meditating in a garden which had no flowers. The sense of being enclosed within four walls of the courtyard was an opportunity to reflect on life. On summer nights, we slept under the stars, and one would plot one's journey of life. Sometime it would keep you awake until the sunlight faded the start from your, vis from your vision. On my last visit, I went to see an old friend of my mother's growing up. I did not know anyone who lived in a high-rise building. Now she was living in an apartment complex. She turned to me and said, it's so strange to live in a place where neither the floor nor the roof is yours. I was reminded of a temple I visited in South Asia, where they had a wall lined with numbered tin temple, numbered tin boxes containing ashes of people cremated in the temple. It looked like a grid of a high-rise apartment complex that is placed to end your life, not live your life. The last time I had a patch of earth to plant a garden was in Delhi. More than 50 years ago. Now the only plants I have are on my windowsill, but every new blossom is still a reason to celebrate. And the last one was the fragrance, which I did in memory of my mother. So I didn't I'm sorry, I did it.